A coastline offers lots of opportunities for adventure. Kayaking and boogie boarding are two of my favorites. But today's video is about another favorite, exploring tide pools. To kick off this video, let's talk about what a tide pool is and why they are special. As you would expect, the story starts with ocean tides, which is the rising and falling of the ocean level caused by the gravity force of the moon pulling on the water. On a sandy beach, when the tide comes in, we may have to move our beach towels further inland. And when the tide goes out all the way, the water drains away from us. Things dry out pretty quickly, leaving it looking desert-like. But on a rocky shoreline, the tide and the land interact differently. When the tide comes in, the rocks are covered in water. But since the rocks aren't all evenly sloped back toward the ocean, when the tide goes out, some water gets trapped and left behind. These are the tide pools, and they create miniature ecosystems. These tiny worlds are set apart and are full of life. Though they may look peaceful and serene, make no mistake. Life here is full of challenges. At high tide, the temperatures in these pools is the same as the chilly ocean. When the tide pulls away, the sun heats up the little pools of water and the temperature swings up. Then, there are the waves that crash and pull at everything they hit, trying to sweep the rocks clear. And even though the animals that live in the tidal pools are confined to this micro world, other animals, like hungry birds looking for a meal, can visit. Exploring the tide pools is a constant study of adaptation, how the animals and plants are equipped to deal with these challenges. One of the first ways you notice this is the composition of the tide pools changes depending on what zone you're looking. The zone being how high up in the rocks you are. The zones are divided up into four areas, the low, middle, high, and splash zones. The low zone spends most of its time underwater and the splash zone spends the least. The result is that even though these pools are only yards apart, the ecosystem and the life you find there can be quite different. Our tide pool adventure took place in La Jolla, California. Exploring these tide pools is free, but we opted to hire a local guide to help us make the most of our visit. This is Matt, and he is a marine biology educator. They do move, they do actually move like shrimp. It's a good observation. We do have. Let's check out some of the things we saw. One of the first things you notice is the unusual erosion patterns in the sandstone rock. These circular shapes aren't what you'd expect from wave action, and there's a good reason for that. Waves didn't shape them. Snails did. These are periwinkle snails, and though small, they have a strong muscle that keeps them firmly attached to the rock, keeping them from getting washed away. They eat algae and scrape off the rocks with a tongue-like structure that has microscopic teeth. Over time, and with large numbers of snails, this scraping action actually wears down the rock and shapes it, leaving these patterns in pools. Their shell protects them from predators, but it also has a special adaptation for life in a tide pool. The shell has a little lid called an operculum which lets them close themselves up in their shell to keep them from drying out. Another animal that uses a shell are these California mussels. And are these little uh, mollusks? Yes. Uh, those are mussels. Those are mussels. Yeah, those are California purple mussels. Ironically, they're not purple. But um, they are like a giant Brita filter. So they're filtering out the ocean water. They're ingesting all the plankton and other minerals that are in the water and then with their output valve they're releasing all that filtered ocean water back into the sea. They are a bivalve mollusk which means they have a two-part shell with a hinge for opening and closing. They attach themselves to the rocks or to each other in clusters using thin super strong threads that they produce that acts like glue. 
The beds they create provide hiding spots for crabs, snails, and small fish. They also help clean the water, filtering as much as two gallons of water every hour. They are also a food source for starfish, otters, birds, and humans. Not every mollusk has a shell. That is the case for this group of animals called nudibranch. They are a kind of sea slug and they do some pretty cool stuff. First of all, they come in a wide range of colors, but they use their coloring in two very different ways. Some are colored to camouflage themselves, making it hard for predators to find them. Others are brightly and vibrantly colored, which makes them easy to spot, but it also serves as a warning to would-be predators. Their bright color is like a giant billboard saying, I'm toxic to eat and will make you sick. But many of these nudie branches don't make their own toxins. They are able to steal toxins from the things they eat, like jellyfish, sponges, and anemones. This beauty is called a Spanish shawl. The fiery orange parts are its gills. And while some of the nudie branches are only capable of crawling, this one can arch and twist in a motion that allows it to swim. You may be wondering if there are other sea slugs, and the answer is yes. We found giant sea hares hanging out. These are the largest sea slugs in the world, capable of growing three feet long and up to 30 pounds. They have some rabbit-like features leading to its name. This includes how they look while they slowly graze on algae. But the giant sea hare is also capable of swimming in a butterfly-like fashion, using large side flaps to propel themselves. Some sea hares release ink as a defense mechanism, but the giant sea hare relies on its size and its dark color to deter predators. When it comes to crabs, you can find several types of them, and it's an interesting study to see the differences in how they adapt to tide pool life. There are striped shore crabs that are small and quick. They use a fast sideways run to escape threats. In contrast, these kelp crabs are slow moving, but they have sharp, strong claws that not only help them eat, but they can use them to defend themselves. Actually, type of crab. So we have the short crabs back here, the normal yeah. ones we've been seeing. These are a little bit more pelagic. They're a little bit more open water. These are known as kelp crabs. What was that word you just used? Pelagic. Pelagic. Pelagic, pelagic oh. means yeah, more like open, open water, open ocean. Yeah. So these crabs are built kind of hard to see, but some of their legs look much more like spider-like, and they're more spiky. They don't have fins like, like your blue crabs. Are the kelp crab's color changes based on what they eat which also helps them camouflage. And although you can find them in the tide pools, they are much more common in deeper waters like kelp forest. Dropped it or people shoot it off, scared it off. Yeah, it is for sure dead though, it's done so. Yeah, another striped shore crab, this was probably a female. She has a big apron right there. Yeah. The bigger apron holds more eggs. The males have more of just a line down the middle there. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Hold him. All right, welcome to. He's yeah. dead. You yeah, it's not going to pinch you. Oh, you got it? Okay, all of these are little tracks, so those are the little... Those are the snails. Those, those are the snail trails. Yeah, exactly. One of the most common animals we found were the sunburst anemones. Anemones are related to jellyfish and coral. These creatures can move, but only very slowly, unless they detach themselves and drift away. When submerged, their tentacles unfurl and wait for food to float by. Then they use a mild stinging toxin to stun small fish or crustaceans and use their tentacles to pull the food into their mouths in their center. During low tide, they pull in their tentacles and cover themselves in sand and shells for protection. The sunburst anemone likes to live alone rather than in clusters and they are equipped with special battle tentacles to help them fight off other anemones for space. 
You can use my arm if you need it. Perfect. And then step right here. On this. Sure. And then you can go across right here. Yeah, you can see use my arm and then walk right up there. Perfect. Not everything we found was an animal. We learned about plants as well. Of course, there was the algae that serves as a food source for so many things that we talked about. But we also found several kinds of kelp and seaweed. Down here, a type of brown algae called feather boa kelp. We thought this was kelp. <laughs> yeah, it is kelp. You know why they call it feather boa kelp? Why? Like because, <laughs> because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, just like a feather boa. Take it. So, but they also have these little bubbles on them. Go ahead and actually break this open. Squeeze, oh, it, squeeze it really hard. We'll get one for your, for your folks too. Oh. Thanks. Go ahead and break this, it open. This is what I think you stepped on earlier. Made it pop. Inside. You want to break this one open? Squeeze it really hard. Look, I don't think. Look. You don't want to? I'm not going to throw it. Many of these plants grow air pockets to help keep them buoyant. Yeah. Being on the surface of the water allows them to capture more sunlight, making photosynthesis possible. Though the buoyant bubbles are a common adaptation, plants can approach it in different ways. Some use many small bubbles, and some use fewer large bubbles. This is just another example of the diversity of solutions found in nature. Pop one of those. Right here. There are some tide pool animals we didn't see on this visit. Starfish are some amazing animals that come in a wide range of sizes, colors, and shapes. And if you are lucky and have a sharp eye, you might also find an octopus hiding out. Fortunately, if you're in the La Jolla area, you can see all these animals and continue learning about the tide pools and many other aspects of marine life by visiting the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. It's a world-class aquarium, research, and conservation center on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Thanks for joining us as we learn more about tide pools and the creatures and plants that call them home. See you on our next adventure!